So for these first ones, you're asked for the domain and range, and then you're asked to identify whether or not it's a function. So our domain for this one, we need to realize that there should be arrows here on the end. Now, if you didn't have the arrows, you probably put it from negative 10 to positive 10. But on the test, I do want to make sure there's arrows there. And that domain would be from negative infinity to positive infinity. And then our range, that was how far below the x-axis to how far above. And that was going to be from negative 5 to infinity. And this does pass the horizontal line test, or vertical line test. So if we look at that vertical line, notice that it only intersects our graph at most once. So is this a function? Yes, this is a function. Okay, so for the next one, our domain here, it looks like you've got a vertical asymptote going on somewhere through here, kind of looks like. And so we are going to look at the domain. It's going to be broken up. It's going to be from negative infinity up to, I call that negative 2, or somewhere in that area. And then union from negative 2 to positive infinity. And then for our range, that's going to be how far below to how far above. And notice here, it looks like you've got a horizontal asymptote there. And so that's going to be from negative infinity. And I call that negative 3. And then union negative 3 to infinity. And yes, this is a function. Okay, so for the next one, what's the domain here? As far left to as far right. So negative infinity to positive infinity. But notice the range. We're staying bounded between positive 1 and negative 1. So if we're staying bounded between those, then our range is going to be from negative 1 to positive 1. And is this the function? Absolutely. So solving for y, remember that means that you need to get y by itself. You're going to move everything over. So for this one, I'm going to subtract our 4 over. And so you have negative 6y equals 12 minus 4x. Or you can put negative 4x in front. It doesn't matter. Just move it to the other side. And then we're going to go through and divide everything by negative 6. And if we do that, then we have y equals 2. Looks like it's going to be a negative 2. And then it's going to be plus 2 thirds x. And you can write it, as some people were asking earlier about, can you write it 2 thirds x minus 2? Sure. It's the same thing no matter which way you write it. I don't care. And then is this a function? Yes. This is a line. That is definitely a function there. Okay, for our next problem, same process again. We are solving for y. So we're going to move our <laughs> 6 over, and we're going to move our 18. And if we do that, then I have negative 2 thirds y equals 6 plus 18. Now, I know the fractions, we don't want to, some people are great with doing the fractions all at one time and some want to break it apart. I feel like it's a little bit easier to understand if we break it apart. I'm going to, I dropped an X there. I'm going to multiply everything by 3 first. And if I do that, then those are going to cancel. We have negative 2Y equals 18 plus, and that's going to be 54X. And then I'm going to come back and divide everything by negative 2. Now, you can do all of that in one step if you want to, but if you have trouble with fractions, I encourage you to divide it up. And so that's going to give you y equals negative 9 minus 27x, or you can write that y equals negative 27x minus 9. Don't care which one. And then is this a function? Yes. All right, now for number six, we're going to mark out that y because leaving the y in, we would have to do completing the square. And we've not seen completing the square in a long time. It was last year sometimes. So we're going to change that. And we will come back and solve it when we have completing the square taught to us. So again, first thing, we're going to solve for y. 
So I'm going to subtract x over, and I'm going to subtract 4x squared over. And if I do that, then I end up with y squared equals negative 35 minus 4x squared. You need to take the square root of both sides, and when you do the square root, make sure you incorporate plus or minus. So you're going to end up with y equals plus or minus the square root of negative 35 minus 4x squared. <coughs> and now this time, notice your y value. You've got two different signs there, plus and minus. And if you notice that the y term is squared, anytime you have that, then this is not going to be a function. Okay, so for f at 3, that's where I had to go, or negative 3. I plugged in negative 3 over here. So hopefully we got negative 3 plus 3. So for that one, you should have gotten 0. For the next one, I'm going to plug in 9 up here. So then that's going to give me 9 squared plus 3 times 9. And for that one, I got, I want to say 108 for that one. Okay, and then down here with negative 5a, that's g, so you have to plug in function g. And so that's going to give me negative 5a all squared, and then plus 3 times negative 5a. And when I substitute in there, I'm going to get a positive 25a squared. Don't forget to square the a. A lot of times people forget that. And then minus 15a. And then the last one, we're subbing in 4c, or minus 1, into function f. So that's going to be 4c minus 1, and then plus 3. We're going to combine those two, so 4c plus 2. For this, we're just looking at the graph or the equation, and we're picking out the x and y intercepts. So here for this one, it looks like you've got a couple of intercepts going on there and there and there. So for your x-intercept, you should have one zero, I think, and the other one I got was five zero, and then your y-intercept was zero negative five. Okay, number two, or 12, sorry, the one got cut off. So number 12, that's gonna be <coughs> here. So you've got four zero. But the y-intercept there, if you put none, you're going to be wrong because you only see part of the graph. You don't see all of it. So they were being sneaky there. If you let x be 0, notice that your y-intercept has to be 15. So your y-intercept for this one is 0, 15. Okay, for this one, they ask you to solve this algebraically. So for the first part, if you're solving and finding your zeros, you let f of x be zero, and you're gonna have some factoring involved. So we're gonna have zero equals, and that's gonna be x squared minus seven, and x squared minus four. Okay, a lot of people were concerned about the x squared minus seven. What you can do is factor it with square root of seven and negative square root of seven and be really strange. Or we can set each part equal to zero and solve it from here. You can do that. And then we can add seven over to the other side. And I think most people do this. And when you take the square root, though, be super careful not to miss your plus or minus. That's the, if you're normally doing this, that's where it gets missed. And then you're going to go back and say x squared minus four is zero. So x squared is four. Four, and you take the square root of both sides and you get plus or minus 2. So up here you've got plus or minus root 7 and plus or minus 2. And keep in mind you can always look at that highest power to check to see if you have the right amount of zeros. We needed four zeros in this and that's what we found. So be careful with that. And then your y-intercept, you're going to let x be 0 and if you plug that in you get 28. So your y-intercept is 0, 28. Okay, over on the other one, same process again. So this time we're going to let g of x be 0, 
You have the square root of x plus 9, then minus 4. We're going to add our 4 over. And this time, instead of doing the square root, we need to square it. So be careful with that. You don't put a plus or minus here. You're just squaring both sides. And then we're going to subtract our 9 over. So x is 7. So there's our 0. It's going to be 7, 0. Or you can just write 7, either one. Okay, now let's plug in and let x be 0. So in other words, we're finding g at 0. So that's going to be the square root of 0 plus 9, then minus 4. So then that's going to give me the square root of 9 minus 4, or you're going to have 3 minus 4, which is negative 1. When you're labeling the points, um, point A here, notice that A is sitting right here. It is not the largest or the highest point over the entire domain. It is just a high point in this little interval. If you look at just all around it there. So this one was a relative max. Point B. Notice point B is kind of down here, but it's not the lowest point over the domain, just the lowest point over the interval, just a small interval there, so that's a relative min. Point E should be a relative min, and point F should be a relative max. Now, we didn't classify point D, so let's do that. Point D is going to be an absolute max because it is the highest value over the entire domain. So that's an absolute max. And then over here, point C, we'll see, it's kind of interesting. You've got your point there. That is that point of inflection where you don't change direction, you just change shape, change the concavity there. So point C, is a point of inflection, POI. So make sure you can classify those points. You will be asked that as well. And then finally, the last part, increasing, decreasing intervals. So you always read this left to right. I always get asked that, and it's really confusing if you don't read it left to right, for sure. And so if you want to highlight going through here, that's a great idea. So if we start at far left, notice that this function is decreasing over the x values from negative infinity up until, and I think I made that one a negative 1. You could do negative uh, 1.5-ish. Anything kind of over in that interval between 0 and negative 2 would be fine. Now, if you put negative 17, I'm going to think you're a crackhead. So don't put that. Make sure it's inside the nice little interval and you're good. And you're also decreasing from here to here. That's another place that you would be decreasing. And let's go ahead, though, and swap over to increasing from here to here. And I put that, whenever I wrote it in, I put that to be from negative 1 to positive 1. I need to put parentheses. Also, parentheses or brackets. Technically, it should be a bracket by the definition of increasing, but we use parentheses as well So, because that's always up for a debate. I don't mind whichever one you want to use. Just make sure you do have parentheses where infinity is involved. That's the only thing. Okay, so where would we, we increase from negative 1 to 1? And then we decreased again from maybe 1 to, or yeah, 1 to 2. Did y'all put 1 to 2 maybe? And then you turned around and increased again from 2 to infinity. Does that make sense? Okay, and then our last problem here, a lot of times people want to say that there's a little piece of increasing there. Again, that's up for debate. We don't have out our calculators and we're not zooming in real tight here. Um, you can put that you are decreasing over the entire domain simply because this area here, what kind of points should be sitting in there? What do y'all think? Somewhere in there we should have a 
point of inflection because we're not changing our direction, we're just changing that concavity. So here, our decreasing interval, we can put from negative infinity to positive infinity. If you wanted to incorporate right here, since we're not using those calculators and zoom in a little tight interval there, I wouldn't mark it wrong. But if you see that, you can pretty much, well, bet it's going to be um, decreasing over the entire domain.